Our guest is John McCarthy. He is the state's attorney in Montgomery County, Maryland. John McCarthy, thank you for joining us. It's great to be with you again. How are you? Again, if you have questions or comments, 800-433-8850 is the number to call. A number of violent killings during the past several weeks have shaken up people, just not in Montgomery County, but throughout the entire region. This, just this past week, there were headlines about a Damascus man who's been accused of beating his three-year-old son to death. You have said that this spate of violence has called into attention the role of law enforcement in how we care for and how we deal with people struggling with mental illness. What do you feel you've learned during the past several months about the intersection of mental illness and our criminal justice system? Well, l let me say, most of the cases that you referred to, uh, there appeared to be uh, some profound, persistent mental health issues uh, that were existent within the, the lives of the people involved in, the, in those cases. And obviously I'm not making no prediction about how this ultimately will play out in the courts. Uh, but I, I think it's uh, maybe system, uh, symptomatic of what happens uh, as a community when we oftentimes begin to focus on an issue when something becomes, I don't want to say sensationalized, but it sort of grabs our attention. And, and the reality is uh, that increasingly there is an intersection in the criminal justice arena between mental health and people who find themselves in our jail or in our courthouses charged with crimes. Uh, and uh, those crimes to which that you referred, oh, these, are, these are the most egregious kinds of offenses because they're all homicides involved in the cases that you referred to. Uh, but we see, and the numbers are, I think, somewhat shocking. Uh, in Montgomery County, last year, 28% of the people who presented in our local county jail upon presentation at the jail needed immediate psychiatric intervention. That was over 2,000 prisoners. Uh, that's an enormous, an enormous toll, an enormous challenge to people in the corrections facilities as, as well as it is to the courts. Uh, what, what's really happening, since we've deinstitutionalized the mentally ill in America, uh, beginning in the 60s and into the 70s, we have put people on the streets without creating a network to sustain those people and what's happening our jails our jails now are uh, i don't know what's masquerading as what but our jails are our largest mental health facilities that's what doug duncan said on this program last week when he was talking about that as an issue we don't want the jails to become mental health hospitals and, and institutionalized places but that <coughs> appears to be exactly what it is the massive homeless problem whether it's in this city or other urban areas or in the suburban areas you have a homeless issue in montgomery county uh, many of the people who are homeless are mentally ill, but well, they have a right to be out there. Well, and it's they, a nationwide so, issue because in today's edition of the New York Times, the director of corrections in the state of Colorado has an op-ed piece in which he said that the people who are held in solitary confinement in the jails there tend to be people who are mentally ill, and then they are often released directly into the community, causing all kinds of havoc. Are there remedies that you would well, urge well, I, I think there are, I think take? there are a couple of remedies, and I, w I will tell you, uh, uh, with, all due, with respect to Mr. Duncan's comment, I, I, I think that our jails have already become our largest okay. mental health institution, so okay. that, that ship has sailed. That's where we are. The Cook County Jail by itself, there's 9,000 prisoners at Cook County Jail today. Uh, I, I verified this number. Well, there are over 3,000 that are in the mental health ward. I mean, and about a third is about what you're dealing with. Are there solutions? Yeah, I do think there are some solutions. I think that uh, there's some, and, and again, th these are very sensitive um, uh, civil rights issues for people because uh, there is a bill in Maryland and that's, that addresses the potential issue of forced medicating uh, people who could be maintained very safely in the community that would not come into the criminal justice system if we liberalized the ability of doctors and or hospitals or others to force medicate them because most of the people we see are individuals who can be sustained perfectly well in the community if they stay on the regimen of their psychiatric medications. Uh, there's another bill that's in Maryland uh, that's being discussed about lowering uh, the legal standard for w when a person is deemed to be dangerous and potentially liberalizing the ability of us in some instances to put people into uh, some type of treatment facility, have them committed involuntarily. Uh, th that's, those are among two of the proposals. There are, there are other things that are being done uh, in many major cities, including Baltimore, uh, where they've established drug courts, where we look for alternatives to incarceration for low-level offenders of nonviolent crimes, where we, look, I know that there are people that come in and out of our jail in Montgomery County that we see the same person maybe 8, 10, 12 times a year. 
for relatively insignificant crimes, but because we don't maintain them on their medications or supervise them once they're back in the community, we're going to see them again in 60 or 90 days. A lot of people talk about the deinstitutionalization of mental health patients, but very few people want to take that step and say, Perhaps the country went too far and that the, the facilities were horrific in too many cases, which led to the and the civil rights of the people there. But maybe it's time to say, is it not possible in this era to have a hospital that would serve the mental health patient uh, and keep that person from being a homeless person during the horrible winters or the or keep the, the criminal keep justice the, and, system and keep from the having criminal justice it. system from being overburdened? Or is, is it too much to take that step to say we need? more mental health hospitals to handle this influx of people well, coming. Well, yeah, Mr. Deeds' issue, issues in, in, in Virginia that I know that you've uh, have well covered before yep. in earlier reports. Uh, you know, I, I think it is a tragedy that we've actually. I think there are less beds now available for the mentally ill in Maryland, and we've closed some facilities in the last couple of years. And we're moving in the wrong direction. Uh, how, how is it that our jails are filling up? We've gone from 20 percent in the last several years of people in our jail needing immediate mental health intervention to 28 uh, percent, we are becoming increasingly uh, a mental health, uh, mental health facility. Uh, I, I think that we have to look for more beds, and, and I think there's a very tough conversation for the community to have, but there's a, a conversation between public safety, balancing public safety, and, and at the same time maybe in some ways affecting what some people would describe as the civil liberties of individuals who are mentally ill. You get into uh, involuntary commitments. You get into compulsory uh, medication of individuals. These are these are civil rights issues. I understand that, but in order to get a handle on that, there's a real question. As a prosecutor, how do issues related to mental health affect how criminal cases are handled? Well, I think quite candidly, the system is not set up to deal with those issues. I mean, in, in the most severe cases, uh, we have uh, people who raise issues like of competence. Is somebody so men, uh, somebody so severely mentally ill, they're not ready to even be put on trial? That's a very small percentage of cases, but that does come up. Uh, we have issues of what were traditionally known as insanity or criminal responsibility. Uh, those, those, whether or not a person was so profoundly ill at the time they committed an offense, they should not be held criminally responsible for it. Again, that's a very small percentage. The vast majority of of the issues have to deal with people who commit most of these offenses are going to be re they're going to be reintroduced into our community how can we put them back on the street supervised in such a fashion that they're not going to pose a danger to themselves or others or simply come back to us again 30 days later uh, so it's, it's community resources that are supervising these people maintaining and more, making sure that they're on their medications medication is a huge issue here I mm -hmm. think in most of these cases because if you maintain people on their meds uh, most of these people can be made safe to live in our communities, to work, and be contributing members of our community. Some people would say that you had, I think your website says 25,000 different crimes from the most minor to the most serious in your uh, shop every year. But some people would say that any person who commits murder or, or kills someone else, is, is, there's a mental issue, there's a mental health issue there. Is that, is that really true? I, I don't agree with that statement. I don't, I mean, I, 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 look, I, I, I I, it would be wonderful if we could say that uh, people were that no one ever takes another human life, and it's uh, except for the fact that they have a mental illness. Uh, uh, having done this more than thirty years, that's not been my experience. Yeah. On to the telephones, please. Down your headphones, gentlemen, because we're going to be hearing from Larry in Arnold, Maryland. First, Larry, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me add. Uh, apparently, your panel is too young to remember uh, LEAA and the uh, and uh, uh, the law enforcement ad administrate. What's LEA? Law enforcement agency administration, right? Right, and and uh, NIMH, National uh, Institutes of Mental Health. You're right. See, back in the day, these these questions were all answered. And they were answered very effectively. When the institutions were closed, the money was supposed to go with the patient into the community to pay for services. Instead, instead, the legislature said, oh, look at this. We've got, we've got the end of the rainbow here. Okay, but having gotten into the rainbow, we know exactly how we got into it. What are you suggesting about what should be done my, about it? My thing is that the people should, should, the conversation should be about, okay, we, we messed it up. 
Now we're going to go back and fix it. And guess what? Uh, taxes are going to have to pay for this stuff. And this, this NIMBY stuff but, is going to have to go away. Okay. But allow me to have John McCarthy respond to that. Uh, <clears throat> he's suggesting we go back and basically do what we were doing before. Uh, and also you're going to have community facilities and not let not-in-my-backyard folks stop you from having truly community-based mental health services. That was the point he was making, yes. Uh, I, I, look, well, I thought that there was a, something that you said that I actually agreed with, and that was that uh, I think that when we deinstitutionalized individuals, what we did not do is correspondingly build a network that were community-based networks to maintain these individuals who had previously been institutionalized. That's where the failing is, and, and quite candidly, it, it would be, I don't know if it's a pay me now or a pay me later kind of a situation, but I, I think we have to invest greater dollars into those community-based resources. Otherwise, you're going to see them in, as we are increasingly seeing them in our jails. And you go, look, I, I've lived in Washington for more than 30 years, and you walk around here and you go to any intersection and corner. Anybody who lives in this community understands the increasing presence of people who are mentally ill in our community, people who are homeless in our community. It's there. It's apparent. It's, it's changing the, the picture of our community and the fabric of our, of our community, and we need to do something to change that. And, look, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in uh, cr the criminal justice field, and increasingly I am seeing the intersection between mental health and, and what happens in my courthouse and in my office. And, I, I, and obviously, uh, we've got to bring some attention to it. And unfortunately, uh, one of the reasons that I'm now talking about it is because of these very critical, very serious cases that took place in the last couple of months where there are profound persistent mental health issues present in each of these cases. Speaking of that, the Brian Patrick O'Callaghan has been charged with the, the death of his th three-year-old son. Uh, what, what, what can you tell us about that case? I know it's... it's it's, it's well, uh, new, uh, again, uh, does this fit uh, into this conversation? No, I don't think that Mr. O'Callaghan's case does not uh, fit into to the conversation we're having uh, because, the, to, okay. to my knowledge, that the issue of mental health has not been brought up in that particular case. I don't, I don't okay. want to comment at all about the okay. merits of that case, okay. uh, only to say that I think his case is to be distinguished from the others that okay. we are talking about this morning. Okay. Uh, speaking of how cases are handled in Maryland, state judiciary administrators have asked the highest court in the state to throw out a ruling that low-income defendants have a constitutional right to public defenders at their first bail hearings. Um, what do you feel about that? What do you feel is the most reasonable outcome here? Well, first of all, I disagree with the opinion that was issued by the Court of Appeals initially. I think they, it was a wrong-headed decision. Uh, I think the decision of the court, and again, uh, the, they decided this case based on uh, the Maryland Constitution, not the federal Constitution, because uh, courts all across America facing the same issue did not reach the same conclusion that Maryland reached. I think that this decision comes with a price tag of about a half a billion dollars over the next 10 years. Uh, on the state and local level, uh, and uh, the, the, our Attorney General, Doug Gansler, who you mentioned a little bit briefly in the previous segment, has just filed an appeal again asking that the new Court of Appeals, because it's, it's actually newly constituted because some of the people that who were on the court previously have now retired, the, 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 I think the thought is in Annapolis that as the court is currently constituted, the decision would have not been the same. Uh, I think that uh, Maryland, uh, here's the reality. If you get arrested in Maryland, you get taken before a commissioner, and, and, and a quasi-judicial official makes a, a decision about what your conditions of uh, release are going to be and whether you're going to be held or not held, uh, and uh, about 18 hours later, you see a judge. I think you should have uh, counsel, and my personal opinion is you should have a lawyer with you when you go before a judge the very first time. Uh, within 24 hours of your arrest, you're going to see a judge, and a lawyer should be there. But what we're doing is... We have a very unique situation in Maryland because someone gets to see someone about their bond twice within the first 24 hours. There's only two. There's one other state in the country that does it the way we do. Quite candidly, some people would have argued that we had the gold standard. What state is that? I, you know, I, I, I don't. I figured you didn't remember. Or you would have. Said no, well, I would. I, 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 thanks <laughs> for, ca thanks for catching me. I'm on sorry. That. I just wonder what state it is. Yeah. We can find out later. Uh, but but the reality is, I, I think uh, uh, this. Um, 
I, I did not favor this decision. It was a four to three decision as it, it came down from the court. Uh, I, I don't know if they're going to revisit it or not, but uh, right now the best proposal, I think, is, is the one that's coming out of the governor's office where we m might go to what we call a risk assessment instrument. And when an individual is arrested in Maryland, rather than go to a judicial officer, uh, basically a caseworker is going to fill out a risk assessment instrument based on some socially so, social science researched criteria to make a determination whether you're going to be released or not. Running out of time, but the county's domestic violence coordinating council is going to be holding a symposium on safe teen dating this coming weekend. What are you hoping to achieve there, and where do you feel efforts to curb domestic violence, particularly among young people, are coming up short? You only well, have about a minute left. W one of the things we found out is that uh, in teen dating relationships, one in three teen dating relationships, unfortunately, have had violence in them. One in two de teen dating relationships have threatened violence in them. These are national statistics. Wow. What, we, what we're trying to do is when a young person is learning or beginning that, that the inter uh, that relationship kind of buildings and learning how to date other people and how, to, how men are supposed to treat women and women are supposed to treat men, we are trying to teach them uh, where the right parameters are with the hope that if you learn those parameters as a young person, when you first begin dating, later on you'll be less likely to be allow yourself to be a victim of domestic violence and stand up for yourself. John McCarthy is the state's attorney in Montgomery County, Maryland. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.